Well, today I'm going to talk about a phenomenon known as the Mach number independence principle, which is a feature of flight at very high Mach numbers, where that if uh, all the equations we use for, say, pressure ratios, flow deflection angles, typically incur a Mach number squared term, so if Mach number is much bigger than one, Mach number squared becomes the dominant feature of the equations, and we can ignore other terms for first order accuracy in comparison with them. This is a very useful thing to do for simplifying our calculations, but also for understanding the phenomena that are dominating the processes in hypersonic flow. And more importantly, if we want to do experimental testing, it's a, a feature that enables us to do a, a flow simulation at lower than flight Mach number, which actually makes it very much easier to simulate the flows in a ground-based facility. Because ground-based facilities generally involve some sort of ducted flow. If it's a shock tube, you drive a shock tube down a pipe. If it's a blowdown tunnel, you have a large reservoir of stagnated gas, and you have expand it through a nozzle. And at high Mach numbers, the viscous effects building up on the nozzle make it very hard to get good uniform high Mach number flow. So if this schematic here represents a, a re-entry capsule, you might be flying at, for instance, Mach numbers of the order of 20, and you might have velocities of the order of say six kilometers per second. If we want to recreate that in a shock tube, it, it becomes very difficult because the total pressures involved can be the order of gigapascals. Gigapascal is like a thousand megapascals, 10,000 atmospheres, 150,000 psi, whichever units you like. Either way, it's a big number. And if your simulation concept involves expanding flow from a reservoir, like for instance, a blowdown tunnel, you've got a reservoir of stored gas, you expand it through the nozzle up to your hypersonic flow condition. The, if it's a nice tropic expansion, the total pressure is conserved through here, so this gigapascals, you need to have that in your reservoir. And it's very hard to build vessels to take gigapascals, and it can go up to tens of gigapascals. Also, the total temperatures associated with this are of the order of 10,000 degrees K. Uh, and so you have to have that in your reservoir as well. It's very hard to design these high-pressure facilities to take such extraordinary high temperatures. The Mach number independence principle gives us a way around that. If we test at, say, Mach 5 in this flow, turns out the stagnation pressures required to simulate this flow drop by orders of magnitude. So you can end up doing a test in a pressure vessel with, say, 5, 10, 20 megapascals in it rather than gigapascals. And that is a very useful thing to be able to do. So on this figure we have a simulated re-entry from a ballistic capsule from low Earth orbit, about 8 kilometers per second. And you can see, as I said, the total pressures, are gig total pressures are peaking out of the order of gigapascals, which are difficult numbers for us to recreate. However, we don't really need those high total pressures in simulating our flow, because all we're really interested in is the flow behind the bow shock. And as you go through a bow shock, as you would know, you lose an awful lot of total pressure. So if we can do this trick of testing at a lower Mach number than flight, we, uh, we will then be able to get the same post-shock conditions uh, as we get in flight with a lower total pressure. So take an example here, Mach number 20, this thing's going through at about 1 over 10,000. If you can go to, say, a Mach number around about 5, the number's only about 0.1. So there's an order of three orders of magnitude change in the pressures required. This is a great trick that enables us to simulate re-entry flows in a, a much less challenging test facility. Well, that's fine as far as it goes. However, we've got to make sure that as we do this, this similarity, do this substitution, we're not totally stuffing up the flow fields. We want to have the same basic flow, post-shock flow, uh, in the wind tunnel as we do in flight. Well, what are, what are going to be the important things to recreate? We want to get the streamlines the same. So if you look at a streamline coming through like this, we want the deflection angles to be the same. Pressure ratios are maybe not that important because we can adjust them by setting our upstream pressure to be an appropriate value. So flow deflection, that's something we're going to have to look at. Density ratio is important going across the shock. Chemistry is being involved. We want to make sure these are recreated faithfully in the same flow. We would like to have 
your post-shock temperatures also to be conserved. So we have a look at some of the parameters that are involved in making a substitution and see if it's going to work for us. So if we solve uh, oblique shock equations precisely for a flow, uh, going for the appropriate part of a flow field, we have this expression here for pressure ratio. You'll see it's dominated by this Mach number squared term here. Of course, it's not as big as it might be because it's modified by that sine squared beta term. So what we're going to try and do here is uh, remove the Mach number dependency term, see if we can express it in terms of velocities. Well, we know we can ex we've got a pressure ratio here. We can ex substitute for pressure for a rho RT term, and that, of course, relates to the sound speed. So wherever we see a pressure, we can replace it with a sound speed. So we can reduce the equation for pressure ratio to this term here, uh, which is going just on our upstream properties. And Mach number is only occurring through this Mach number dependent term, this value here. So if we inspect this equation for pressure, you see the, the coefficients at the front of each expression, they're of the same order of magnitude, the rho u squared over gamma type term. Uh, and also we'll note that the Mach number is much bigger than one. So really this term on the left is going to be much less than the term on the right. And this minus one here when your Mach number is 10 or 20, we can really ignore it. We can afford to ignore that as well. So the pressure reduces to one where Mach number is not directly involved. All you need is your upstream rho u squared properties and of course the deflection angle associated with the shape you're putting in there. So we just need to get that right. Now you may wonder if uh, you know velocity is Mach number times sound speed, how can we keep the velocity the same if we've dropped the Mach number from say 25 to 5? Well the only way we can do it of course is if we increase the sound speed. And the way we do that is to use hotter test gas in the shock tube than we have in flight. So remember we're making a sort of modification to our upstream properties by making it a little bit hotter, or quite a lot hotter in some cases, so that the speed is the same when you multiply Mach number by speed of sound. And that sometimes has some detrimental effects, so bear in mind we're doing that. But it's worth doing because we can then get the conditions behind the shock wave pretty well right. So that's taking care of pressure. What about streamlines? We want them to be in the same direction. So if you look at, say, a uh, flow of gas behind the shock, it's got some velocity we might call u2. I'll split that up into x and y components, little u for x, little v for the y component of velocity. And that can be, we can find out what these are exactly through the oblique shock relationships, and there as we see below. Again, if you inspect it, you'll see there are terms that are Mach number dominant. And uh, when Mach number goes to be, become very big, we can do something about it. Obviously, in the top equation here, we can get rid of the 1. Then we've got a Mach number squared over a Mach number squared. Mach number is going to disappear from that. Similarly, in the other curve down here, we've got a 1 over Mach number squared term. Well, that's going to approximate 0 for high Mach number conditions. For doing that, I can derive an expression for our axial velocity component, the u2 which is going to be, I'll call it u2 over u infinity, in fact, your incoming velocity. It's going to be equal to 1 minus twice of uh, sine squared beta over gamma plus 1, as I mentioned, independent of Mach number. Similarly, the same thing for your v2. It's going to be approximately equal to uh, twice sine squared beta over gamma plus 1 with that cotangent term, which remember is just a cos of beta over a sine of beta. So we can express that as twice sine beta cos beta into gamma plus 1. So nice set of equations, noting that Mach number independent. I'll make that approximately because it is to a first order, it's not a precise mathematical equivalence. So you can see from inspection of this that we've got our transverse components u and velocity, uh, u and v, the same. Uh, so that means that the post shock velocity, I call it u subscript s, is the same. So changing the Mach number here hasn't changed the velocity behind the shock and it hasn't changed 
the relative values of uh, x and y velocities, so the streamlines will actually be traveling in the same direction. So if you look at an energy equation now, you've got u squared is the same in both cases, and so that must imply that your CPT is the same. So using that procedure, you, we can see that the post-shock temperature will be the same, which is very good. We've recreated, we know we can get the same pressure in the shock layer, we can get the same temperature in the shock layer, and we can reproduce the stream on. So basically it's the same flow. Now when I say we get the same temperature, that's not the same as getting the same temperature ratio. The temperature ratio remains Mach number dependent all the time, but of course because we are actually starting with an artificially high pre-shock temperature, we're reproducing the same temperature behind the flow, so that's good. So I'll finish this section by going through an example of a re-entry capsule flying at Mach 20 at a at a point in the atmosphere where the static pressure is half a kilopascal, and we'll try and do uh, work out what conditions we would have to produce in a, a wind tunnel or a shock tunnel down in the laboratory with a flight condition of Mach 10. Because we can't really build a 5 metre diameter wind tunnel to run at these high pressure conditions, we'll make our model to have a diameter of 500 millimetres, so effectively we'll be doing a 10 to 1 scale model. OK, well we'll need to work out what our flow conditions in flight are, that temperature, the speed of sound is 317 meters per second. So we've got a Mach number of 20, so our incoming velocity is 20 times that, which is 6340 meters per second. So we'd like to know what our total enthalpy is. H0 is equal to U squared over 2 plus CPT. So that's going to be equal to 6340 squared over 2, plus, uh, although we tend to ignore it a lot, there is a static enthalpy component in the hypersonic flow, so that'll be equal to your temperature, which I made 250K in this example, times a specific heat, but something like a 1,000, which gives you a number of 20.2 megajoules per kilogram. This is a parameter we want to conserve when we do our wind tunnel-based simulation. We can calculate the total pressure that applies for this, and if you do the sums, it turns out to be 2.4 gigapascals, which is, of course, one of those large numbers which are very difficult to create. We need to know what our free stream density is so we can do the matching. So that's equal to P over RT, which comes out to be 0.6969 kilograms per meter cubed. Actually is a pretty high density to be flying so fast at. We would like to know what our pressure is in the shock layer. I call that PS subscript 2. So that's going to be equal to 2 rho infinity u infinity squared over gamma plus 1 from the formula we just produced. And that's equal to 2.33 times 10 to the 5 pascals or 2.33 atmospheres. This is a flight conditions. OK, well that was the flight conditions. What are we going to do in our wind tunnel? Well, I've mentioned we want to conserve velocity in these cases, but actually what we really want to conserve is total enthalpy, which is almost the same as conserving velocity, but not quite. So our total enthalpy, that's H0, it's equal to your kinetic energy, U squared over 2, which dominates the term, plus the CPT term, uh, which is equal to 20.2 megajoules per kilogram in this case. Okay, well we'll rewrite this term here as the, the we call it CPT plus Mach number squared times your speed of sound squared over 2, which we can write as CPT into your Mach number squared over 2 times gamma RT so what I'm trying to do here is work out what temperature we're going to try and set the term to. So this is not actually one of the cases where we can afford to neglect the Mach number. That Mach number squared is going to have to stay there. OK, you manipulate this. What you get is the temperature is equal to total enthalpy divided by specific heat plus gamma R into your Mach number squared over 2. 
which we've already worked out that number is 20.2 times 10 to the 6 divided by CP, we'll take that to be a thousand, representative value for air, times gamma, we're looking at perfect gas 1.4287 for air, Mach number squared is going to be a hundred, and it's over two. So that comes out to be 958K. So we've got to put the air in approximately four times as hot as it is in flight. So what does that mean for the velocity? Okay, now we have then uh, u infinity squared is going to be the Mach number squared times the speed of sound squared, which is going to be 10 squared times, we've got a 1.4 times 287 for our r, times the number I first thought of, which was 958k. That's what our velocity is going to have to be in the simulated flow in the wind tunnel. So that comes out at 6200 meters per second. So it's a little bit slower than the flight speed, which was 6340, I think. And that's to take account of the fact that the gas is hotter, it carries some thermal energy. And of course, if you were really doing this in a shock tube, it wouldn't just have thermal energy. You would be creating some pre-dissociation in the air before the shock, which has enthalpy 2, and you have to take that into account. We're not considering that in this course. OK, that's fine. We've got velocity matched. We've now got to think about the pressure. Well, we know what pressure we'd need to get to match exactly the pressure in flight. But of course, because we're doing a 10 to 1 scale model, we're going to really also want to do some row L scaling as well. So let's say row L scaling. Remember, that's a formula that you have your row times the length scale is conserved. So if we're doing a, a 10 to 1 uh, scale model, the test vehicle in the tunnel is smaller, we need a higher density. So rho infinity then is going to be equal to rho infinity flight times 10, which equals 0 0.0669 kilograms per meter cubed. OK, so that's what we're going to have to set in our wind tunnel. Of course, we set that by getting the pressures right. So what does that mean for pressure? So the pressure we're going to have to set in our tunnel, P is rho RT. So we know we've got the density, that's the point 0 0.06969. So we'll get our pressure from the equation of state. Pressure is rho RT, so it's 0 0.06969 times 287 for the R times 958 for our temperature, which is 19.2 kilopascals. Well, we're going to need to set our test section pressure to be 19.2 kilopascals. So what does that mean about our reservoir? What total pressure are we going to need there? If you look up the pressure tables or calculate them yourself, you get the static pressure P over P naught for Mach number of 10, that is, is equal to 0.2356 times 10 to minus 4, giving you our total pressure we need to set for this condition is going to be 19.2 times 10 cubed over that number there, 0 0.2356 times 10 to minus 4 which equals 800 megapascals. Now that is actually also quite a big number. We had 2.4 megapascals required in flight, 800 megapascals required in our ground test facility. This came about, of course, because we're doing the row L scaling. We had to bump it up by a factor of 10, so it dropped by a factor of about 25, doing this Mach number substitution, and we pushed it up again by another factor of 10 by putting a smaller model in. So actually this number is really not achievable in most test facilities, the exception to this being, of course, the superorbital expansion tubes, whereby you cascade a series of shock tubes in series, and you never actually stagnate the flow. So these total pressures in such facilities are never actually seen as a static pressure anywhere in the flight, so you can get away with it. You don't have to build reservoirs or pressure vessels to contain 800 megapascals. So in conclusion, the Mach number independence principle allows us to test scale models in the laboratory at lower than flight Mach numbers and get a, a very good reproduction of the flow field of the shock layer around the body itself so we can learn, we can study those flows and learn how they'll behave in a real flight situation. We, we should point out that this only applies to blunt bodies where the product of the shock angle, the beta, and the Mach number is a number very much bigger than one.